Welcome to Go Figure. My name is Nadeem Makarin, CEO and founder of Gojek, Southeast Asia's first super app. Gojek does ride hailing, food delivery, payments, even on-demand massages. You name it, we do it. Go Figure is a podcast dedicated to expose the inner workings of ambitious tech companies in the emerging world. We like to talk about things we like and talk about things we don't like. There are a lot of myths out there that we want to dispel, so keeping it real is kind of our mantra. Hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, welcome to Go Figure. Very, very excited about this podcast. Um, We got Ajay Gore in the house, our global CTO. Ajay, how are you? Thank you for coming by. Thank you for having me. Oh, yes, (laughs) thank you very much. And we have uh, Sidhu, uh, our head of global talent and head of India office, um, who has already made an appearance on our our podcast as well. Um, Today, is a topic that is very close to my heart, a topic that I feel is very vague and very buzzwordy, and yet not many people have broken it down into more scientific terms. And we're gonna talk today about culture. We're gonna talk about company culture. Um, This has been a buzzword, it keeps being used everywhere and around, but if, if I had to ask, any average person in our company or outside about what it means to have a great company culture, everyone will spit out a different response, right? Everyone has a, uh, can at some point, wildly different views about what constitutes uh, a good culture and a bad culture. And so I don't wanna say good or bad in our discussions, but I want to define it as high-performing cultures and low-performing cultures, right? First of all, I want to kick off the conversation. Why is culture so important in an organization? What is it? What what is it and why is it so important? How do we even begin to define this? Um, So, you know, just like you said, everyone's going to have a different answer. So, caveat it up front, this is mine, right? I only want standardized answers, dude. <laughs> boring, boring answers. Not gonna happen, bro. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's good, Jay. So, so uh, the way I like to think about it now, and this is something which has evolved over time, is in the beginning I honestly thought it was fluff. I thought this is this. Is, I mean, I'm a programmer, right? I, I started as a programmer. I've been coding since I was a kid, and like, yeah, this is some management fluff, nonsense. Uh, it, it, and over time, I started to realize that in an organization, there are certain things that you want people to do and certain things you don't want them to do. And usually, you try to define these through processes and policies. But the scope, the number of things that you can or cannot do is so vast that if you attempt to codify all of it into a policy, either you get this massive book of rules and it's still incomplete, Uh, which people don't grasp or follow, it's unapplicable, or you create this horrible bureaucracy or a combination thereof. So for me, culture is everything that isn't process or policy, but that still defines what you do or don't do. Defines what you do or how you do it. Or how you do it. You know, Mm -hmm. you know, the choices you make every day. But it has to be manifest in in an activity. Yes. An action. Yeah, the results of it, these are decisions which people make several times a day, hundreds of times sometimes, and you can't codify all of them. It's the stuff that you don't codify. What, what do people do for those decisions? Mm-hmm. That's the culture. Right. So culture, first of all, first rule of culture, culture isn't something that is individual and kept inside your heart yep. or your mind at all times. Culture is a outward manifestation yep. of a shared set of values. Yes. Or and the only way to identify it is through action. What yes. do we do? Yes. What do we do? Or you can say it like culture is a collective expression of a group. Mm-hmm. You can look at it the way, so basically whenever you look say, what is the culture of this country or this company or this place, what you define by when you meet a bunch of people from that specific organization, how do they express yourself, right? And how do, how do they go about expressing themselves within the organization? 
So you can actually codify it or you can actually say it like culture is collective expression of a group in a certain way. And that's what actually differentiates them with the different kind of organizations. Yep. So it has to be somewhat unique to that organization. Otherwise, it's not a culture. It's not going to be something shared within that culture. Yep. Cultures can be similar between companies. Some traits can but, be similar. But they're never the same. Same. Okay. Yep. Right? Yep. I mean, why do the trains run on time in some countries and why do they not run on time in other countries? Is it in the constitution? No, it isn't. Yet, there are countries where the trains run on time and there are countries where they don't. So you're saying that trains running on time or no is a manifestation of culture. culture. <laughs> Interesting. Yep. Dude, like, if you, if you, if you, like, now let's put it down to codifying thing. Punctuality yep. is mm. a culture. Is a culture. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So if you look at punctuality, like how much serious weightage people, leaders do to punct being punctual, being on time, if you start doing that repetitively, then punctuality becomes part of culture. It becomes that one codified DNA that this organization is punctual. Okay, so that's the second telltale. The first telltale, it has to manifest into action. It's not a thought or Correct. a feeling. Yeah. It has to be a collective set of action. The mm -hmm. second thing is what you just said, is that it has to be repeated. Yes. Right? There has a repeated, it's consistent. consistent, or relatively consistent, right? And by the members that belong to that culture, yes. will generally behave in a certain way. Yeah. For example, it cannot be consistent across. And then when, when it's not consistent across, then what happens is when it's majority cons consistent, then other people start following that. Yeah. So a lot of time, the culture is something which gets codified in early days. Mm. And over the period of time, it kind of become rules. Mm. And then if you have this uh, manifestation of ch challenging things, then culture cultivates and motivates people and also molds around the way. So whatever culture you have today, maybe Gojet at the DNA level will still have that culture down the line, say 10 years. But the manifestation of expression of that culture will be very different. Hmm. It can be there as well. So it evolves. It evolves. It yeah. can evolve. Yes. And in many ways, it probably should evolve. It has to evolve. Right? Yep. It has to evolve because it's, there's no, it's not a set rule book. Yep. It's yes. how the collective has decided to behave with one another and externally. Okay. And, and it's very rarely that uh, culture is set by the minority. There are very narrow situations where a minority can set the culture for the majority. It's almost always the majority norm that defines the culture. Aha, but here comes the interesting point. There is a paradigm or a set of beliefs that think that culture is very much top down. Right. Or not very much top down, but it begins at the top. You've, right. We've heard this many times. Yep. Culture begins at the top. Yep. In early days. Sure. Yeah. Right. In later days, it does not. So suppose, I'll give you an example. So suppose we get somebody else um, heading a big organization and he wants to have or she wants to have their own way of working, it will not go down. Punctuality. Punctuality. For mm -hmm. example, if everybody is lazy or everybody doesn't come on time and then somebody one day, one boss comes and we have to be done on 9 a.m., nobody's going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it is early days also matters. So culture also depends on things like, so if you look at us, the way we grew our culture over a period of time in the last three and a half, four years, is more about all of us collectively. Mm. It was not like that we opened some books and we're going to do this tomorrow onwards. We did not do that. Mm. We, all of us had our own traits. And also culture is kind of melting pot of the good values across all the leaders mm -hmm. and people. So basically, over the period of time, what we did, we kind of adopted nice things from everybody and kind of discarded things which did not work out. And that's what actually comes out as a culture. So yep. basically, it's a, if, you look at, if you look at nature, right, it's survival of the fittest, right? Mm. Same way it is, uh, and the, through mut mutations, like if you look at grizzly bear versus, um, what is that bear? Black uh, bear. Black bear or a polar bear, mm. right? The polar bear, there's mutation happened with polar bear, they became white and they survived, right? So culture is also like that. You have these de mutations within the uh, <sighs> leaders, within the people, and then finally the best thing comes out. So this is like a social Darwinism yeah. that, Absolutely, yeah. that behaves yeah. in it. So I mean, a, there's a self-selection process yes. that happens to it. So you're, you're talking about this as a much more organic kind of you know, factor of evolution, almost accidental. But when we look at the books, when we look at all the 
business school, academia, etc. This is something you have to harness, shape, direct. And, and how do you reconcile the topic? I can never deny that I have seen manifest in the organization multiple things that I've noticed our core leadership team doing. Yep. Like I can't deny that. Yep. Like there's definitely a role model influence. Doesn't, doesn't mean that we define all the culture, no. Yep. But there are traits of the culture that I see that is reflected through our top so leadership. So I, I, have, I have a favorite example, which I said, it's, frankly, it's one of the reasons why I work here, right? It's not that you know, I'm, spoiled for, I, I'm not spoiled for choice, mm -hmm. which is, and I noticed this in the early days, which is, you know, someone proposes a feature or a change to the product, to the app, that exploits the driver. And I've seen you, especially in the early days when you know, we were all on the groups together, you know, discussing these things or debating these things or making these calls, where you would jump on that person immediately and say, we will not do things which harm our drivers. We are not going to go zero sum on our drivers. We're, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. And then over time, I noticed this trend very clearly that there is this very clear bias to removing or eliminating choices that harm our drivers. Mm. Uh, you know, there is, there is no conversation that happens in Gojek that lasts for any length of time, which involves, hey, let's do this exploitative thing, mm. which gives us an advantage on GMV or whatever, right? pick a metric, mm. at the cost of a driver mm. that survives for any length of time. And you're no longer in those groups. Yeah. So how did that happen? That's for me a great example. And like I said, it, you know, it's one of the reasons I, I work here. I don't think that's a very common trait in, in ride sharing companies. So I, I'll give you one more example. If you look at this, uh, we recently, like four quarters, no, eight quarters back, we started looking at OKRs. Yep. It was not there with us. OKRs are objectives and key results. Correct. Yeah, we like started, target setting. Yeah, and tool. we started looking at those as one of the ways we can operate ourselves and make sure that we are we are rational across product uh, roadmaps and we are rational across all the data and everything else. And that is stuck on. That is stuck on because it was the right thing to do. And many, many, many if you if you think it's just top down it was it would have not been top down unless people saw merits in it mm. right so over the period of time what happens that like the basic manifesto or the basic what you say principles which we won't deviate from are very simple we will adopt good things uh, which are good for all of us we will never go and do anything which does harm to our customers merchants or drivers i still remember the early days when we used to suspend drivers or we used to do something with customers, you used to be so anal about it. Mm. Like, go find, the, go find the reason why did you do this. How can you log out 500 drivers? They're important. And the number were small at that point of time. But we still take care of those people, right? So over the period of time, if you look at culture, culture is manifestation of good things into adoption for an organization and then collectively expressing that as the right thing for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Without having it written. Without having it written. And so culture is essentially a far more superior tool of management. It's not a tool of management, it's a, but it's, it's a far more efficient, scalable. scalable way of creating shared behavior yep. than any other thing. Yes. And this I agree. Yep. No amount of like guidebooks, manuals, 10 core values, whatever it is, those are things that can help scale up maybe the initial founding teams or the initial leadership team's notion of what good behavior is, of what the correct behavior is. But if you don't codify behaviors culturally, then you will always have to define it through processes and policies which are hugely inefficient. And just not scalable. They're not scalable. I, I'll, give, I'll give one more example. How many times we have let somebody go because it was not culture fit? Most and, time. Correct. And how many times we that is literally the number one reason, reason for us to let people go. Why people are let go in Gojek. How many times yeah. we have been able to exactly codify in the template saying you did not check this box? It's really hard. Correct. So the culture is a manifestation of expression. And when somebody does not express the way we want them to express, or somebody does not accept our expressions, that's where mis misfit for culture happens. Right? Okay, let's let's double click on that, because that's a perfect way, maybe a backdoor way of describing what culture is. Let's talk about letting go of people because they don't fit our culture, right? What's usually the reason? 
Like pick the last three people even, and what are the top maybe three reasons? So when you ask, when someone says, oh, uh, why, why did that person uh, get let go? Oh, he really wasn't a cultural fit. When you ask then, okay, so what, what did he do that ensure? What are they usually? Usually it is they violated one of our values, mm. ethics, integrity. So that is one, one part of culture. Second, they violated one of the principles uh, where we actually wanted them to do something and they didn't do it. Mm. And uh, not because we felt it is wrong, but their team felt it is wrong. So it is organization driven, it's a team driven. And third thing which always I have seen is that they were not happy because they could not find a place in our organization because they are not used to doing those things. That's so right. they maybe come from a very different culture mm. which may not be wrong because that is the culture they grew up with. Yeah. Right? And there are a lot of companies out there who behave very differently. That's right. And that's what, these are the three reasons we so have all- You all don't necessarily need to be a bad manager or a bad leader or a poor performer per se. Yeah. No. But yeah. I, I, you I, may f you may encounter huge amounts of cultural friction. Yes. Right? This concept of cultural friction in an organization that is completely different. And I've seen this happen to a lot of senior hires uh, that we have when they're coming in and they start uh, they come from a from a much more hierarchical culture. Uh, a much more um, uh, almost like revering leadership uh, culture, uh, which is not Gojek. And they start shooting out orders. Yes. They come in here and they start saying, okay, in a very structured way, even politely, right? They're just going like, oh, we should do this, 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 you do that, you do that, you do that. In a very shoot, uh, uh, shoot first, you know, ask questions later uh, company culture. And then they get frustrated because no one actually does it. And what happens, one more thing, is their reporting line, which we don't have, but whoever works with them, start reaching out to you or me or somebody else, and they don't like it as well. Yeah. That also happens, like how did you actually bypass me and go? And our culture is being very transparent, very open. So our culture allows and op let people operate in that manner, and they are like, don't know why, but they don't like it. Yeah. So maybe from where they came was a perfectly fine thing, but over here, they're not culture fit. It, and if like, they can adopt, there are a lot of leaders we, we, have, we have got, they adopted very fast. They realize the value of being open. They realize the value of being transparent. They realize the value of being open. That means they can, if somebody goes and talks to us or somebody else, they can get more help. They don't see it demeaning. They see it very useful. I, but I think, I think it's important, Ajay, to, to put a caveat to this by saying like, not all of the elements of our company culture are necessarily the best. There's no such. They're not. It's, it's hard to define. That's why, again, there's no such thing as like bad culture, poor culture. Yeah. There are there are col But if you're coming in without the ability to adapt to an existing culture, you will almost inadvertently fail. Yeah, but there is something about poor culture. Okay. So that because, for example, the hierarchical thing, right? Yes. There, the the consequence of that cultural trait of ours is that it takes a longer time to get people to buy in to what you want to do and execute. You need to spend time explaining the why, the reason, how it fits to the bigger vision, um, the urgency, and all of this stuff. It takes a lot longer for a leader to start executing once they come into Gojek. But once they start executing, yeah, then everyone I mean, gets the buy-in. We, we, we like to rolling. joke that you know, for, 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 for people who come in with that background, they're very used to having to align upwards but they're unused to having to align sideways and downwards, right. which is an expectation here. Yeah. Right. I mean, to, and in to most, and to be honest, in most most Asian professional uh, cultures, it, it's very it's alien. E it's, yeah, exactly. It's very alien to have to. Why do I have to justify? I'm but a explain. leader. Yeah, yeah. Why do I have to say you're you're a young kid? I'm obviously hired to be above you, yeah. and I have more experience than you. Why are you, you arguing? Just, with yeah, but arguing? but if you look at if you look at one of the values which we believe in is bottom up innovation. If we don't facilitate them that thing, then we, we we would have never been where we are. We would have never allowed the bottom up innovation. We would have never we would have killed the ideas from ground up in infancy stage itself because they would right. have never reached anywhere. Like the way, way I like to think about it is you have effective and ineffective cultures, which is in the context of what that organization is attempting to achieve. Yes. But an effective culture may not be necessarily pleasant 
for somebody coming in from another effective culture. Yes. It is not a commentary on whether a culture is right or wrong. Cultures are effective or ineffective given the goals of the organization. But it doesn't mean that one effective culture will translate well for someone familiar with it who moves to another effective culture. Yes. I'll give it one and more thing. It's very strange how there is almost like you take the analogy of a, of a foreign invader or a pathogen inside a body. Right. And I, I don't mean this in like a, a negative way. It's just it's, it's analogous, the mechanism. As soon as there, a very different culture base enters another culture base, which is different to them, there is almost this automatic autoimmune response. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed this? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like, oh, yeah. And I can't put my finger on how it happens, but people start coming up to me or you and say, hey, this guy, you know, I, how, do, I don't, how do I really deal with him? So, yep. You know, like, or, or, or this guy or girl. And, and, and there's this natural almost like, it's not a rejection right now, but it is creating inflammation. Yep. You immediately see that happening. And that's when you know your culture is thick. Dude, when just, the body treats you as a, like a foreign pathogen yeah. coming into side, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so anytime a leader joins us, uh, especially in ENG or PM department, and they ask me, what is, what, or anywhere else, and they reach out to me and say, what is your first advice you would give me? So I said, for the first four weeks, observe. The next four weeks, absorb. Mm. And then after that, act. Mm. And that is very important. Mm. Because you have to become one before you can execute like one. Yes. And... Whoever, a like, lot of times people have come back to me, senior leadership has come back to me saying, that was really a really nice advice you gave me. Yep. Because, and then I told them, if you would have just gone ahead and act on things the way you see on surface, you will start assuming a lot of things. Yep. Once you assume anything, you always assume a thing in negative connotation. Hmm. You always think, why this cup is here? Why this cup is on the book? And you can assume, a idiot, he did it like that. But there is reason for it. If you ask me why, I can tell you right now why. Because it doesn't make a noise over here, right? Yeah. Same way in our organization, there are a lot of things. Since we have, we are 36 months old or 48 months old. We are like a baby elephant who just started walking and doesn't know where to look for. And one of the biggest things which we have learned over the period of time is that every time when we have done some mistake, there is a valid, very valid reason for it. Yep. When a leadership comes from outside and they see these five things the way they are done and they're absolutely wrong because it's not done somewhere else, if they don't Have observe and absorb, they will never realize the reason for it. And once they realize the reason for it, they can actually empathize and correct it in a much better way than doing a knee-jerk reaction. It's, it's also why uh, you know we, we almost, as a matter of policy now, expect leadership to spend time in the trenches executing for some percentage of their time for exactly this reason. It's why on the engineering side, we, we have this rule that says that everyone must spend time coding irrespective of how senior they are abstracted away from the day-to-day -day stuff they are. You need to spend some percentage of your time writing code because otherwise you will not understand why certain decisions are being made by other people mm. because it's not obvious at the surface and there's no scalable way to surface, surface that. Mm. Even, even for our drivers, Remember what we did? Um, so when we did launch GoCar, we made Kevin drive around. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> one of the incidents that happened with Kevin was a lady got him as a driver and then she took him to laundromat and made him wait over there. She was like, two minutes, I'll come back. And she made him wait, him, made him wait near laundromat and he was like super frustrated. He's like, this is what our drivers go through? We need yeah. to fix this. And then later on what we did, we sent a bunch of our PMs on the road as a go ride drivers. And they were like getting super frustrated. Like, this app is like, this is what our drivers go through. And that kind of empathy, ab observe and absorb, mm. works really well. If it can work well there, it has to work well in the organization as well. Mm. And that's what defines our culture. Mm. Because we treat everybody equally when they come up. We make sure that there's, there's no question on the intent and don't assume anything. If you look at this, this is our culture, but how do you define this? You can't codify it. Mm. It can be handed down from generation to generation. In startups like us, generation is only six months to eight months because we, we are infusing new people all the time. So that's what happens and that's what kind of becomes culture. So people know we have to do the right thing. We don't have to assume. We have, don't have to question people's intent. We have to go ask why this happened instead of 
why are you not doing this those kind of things and that is openness transparency like when you go and talk in our town halls and we are very transparent about our numbers what we are doing we will get that confidence saying look this is what we are we don't when our leadership does not hide anything from us then why we should hide anything from them mm -hmm. and that's why how many times we had down times right we did have down times how many times you went and talked to so many engineers and you got the same answer yeah. it is not a conspiracy theory yeah. it is just being transparency is a culture because what we did we put a psychological safety over there yeah. that is part of culture now if you start talking about these things then these tenets of culture will start coming out yeah i used to be super for, so for the for the <laughs> listeners whenever we had <clears throat> any downtime you know i had i came from kind of the conventional professional management uh background and so I would triangulate things that happened because I made the assumption that there was something else. There was something else. That pe people won't tell the leader or the boss what's really happening. And so, <laughs> several times in Gojek, <laughs> I went to like three or four different people asking, okay, what happened really? What happened really? And when I got the same response after the third one, I'm like, I felt really bad. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, okay, so they are telling the truth. I was like, um, and, and this isn't to say that, you know, in, in that particular example, this isn't to say that there aren't effective cultures that, uh, that uh, you know, do not need this kind of, hey, hands-on coding, for example. Right. There are very effective cultures that function where leadership does not code. But we have an effective culture where leaders do code. Yeah. And, and it's, again, like your point that you said, it depends on what the goal is. Yeah. And I, I believe we've hit this critical point whereby the complexity of our business is at such a high level um, that the, defin the very definition of a performance culture needs to be dramatically different. Yep. Because we've hit that point whereby leaders trying to exert, the more our top leaders try to absorb decision making, the worst outcomes we will get. Yeah. Because we're so far away from the actual problem yeah. uh, at this stage. So so along these lines, how do we then define what a high performing team is for a, you know, like us, a multi top 20 private company in terms of valuation in the world, tech, tech company. Um, at that size, what defines, and at that level of interdependency, that level of complexity, what defines a high performing culture? And if we can define what that culture is, why don't we break it down one level down and say, what are the high performing beliefs or behaviors that we believe can can take us and be able to make sense of this complexity and succeed as a business? Actually, look at our values. Well, that's what values are. Values are in our our core values are a reflection or an attempt. Good or bad, I don't know, but a, a, an attempt, an effort to codify what we believe to be the positive elements of our culture. So, in that sense, if you look at one of the biggest uh, two, which I take out, two of them is walk the talk. Mm. We want our leaders to talk, mm. right? Second, we want them to earn the title. Yeah. These are two things. That means... Earn your title. Earn your title, yeah, right? One and of if our they, core values. Yes. If they want to earn, your, earn their title, and if they're gonna walk the talk, that means they should be practitioners. Mm -hmm. They should be craftsmen. They should be making and refining their skills all the time. If you look around, all of our leaders are actually doing that. They are in the trenches with people. They are the role models for their departments. And that's why it defines that way. If you, if, and that's why we are the way we are. That's why we are the so small team doing operating such a large business, mm -hmm. right? If you don't do that, if I start um, putting my my walk the talk uh, skills aside and starting making sure I have proxies to walk the talk and they have their proxies to walk the talk, so we'll end up with a, such a big large team because I am not doing my work. And there are a lot of companies out there with our valuation and our size which have six times the teams, inch teams, that like we are. We are only 300 people, right? There are people out there where comparatively uh, companies out there who are 2,200, 2,500, 3,000 people. Why is that? The reason is that because those people believe or those people figure out that they can hire somebody else to walk their talk. 
and then they start creating these layers and layers and layers of the people around them. So you know what happens, what end up happening? They actually spend 75% of their time fixing things, mm. while we spend 75% of time creating things. Building things. Building things. Because for them, the feedback loop is so long. By the time they get there is something wrong, yep. they throw it's more bodies. That's and really interesting. Like, so if, if, if a culture is nothing more than the collective behavioral expression of the people within that culture, then you can theoretically hire your way out of a culture. Yes. Yes. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can, uh, if, if you decided to double your headcount within like a year or less than a year, yep. um, you could essentially r remove or, or destroy whatever vestige of Absolutely. culture that you had that was working for you. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Uh, the scalability of a culture, then you reset again yes. from zero. You have to redefine you have again. Noise. Then you, you have noise. That's really interesting, right? Because I think a lot of people's mindset is about talent. When we talk about talent, we're looking at one end of, of the equation only. We're looking right. at how do we hire, hire, hire the best talent, the best talent, the best talent. When actually the mechanism for high performing teams in general is also what is fundamentally at core of their culture. Yep. And if you hire too quickly, or if you hire too quickly, or if you hire leaders too aggressively, then you are diluting that culture by default. Yeah, I have one more thing to say over there on hire. Mm. So what happens is when people or say- Or if you're lucky enough to find people who match Correct, the so what happens is when we say hire, 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 if you are not careful about this, humans actually optimize for this matrix you are measuring them for. So what happens- Sorry, say that again. Humans optimize for the matrix you are measuring them for. Humans optimize for the matrix- The, the matrix. matrix. The matrix you are measuring them You for. are measuring them. Correct. So what happens down the line, third level, when it reaches to a recruiter, his matrix is I have to hire people. Right. So he's focused on numbers. Now, once you start focusing on number and number level one above is also focused on numbers, then they're going to hire the numbers. Mm. What we should optimize for the skills, mm. right? But that's why at Gojek, we don't hire that many people mm. because we are very particular who we hire mm. in terms of every year. Like, for example, when we hire a leader, we make sure they're interviewed at 20 people. Not because we uh, really are very anal about it, but because we want to make sure as much as we are sure that this is the right person for us, they should be sure that this is the right company for yes. them, right? And once you start optimizing for matrix, which is a skill, then you will get this kind of high performing culture and high performing team. But if you start optimizing for the numbers, then you will get high performance numbers. That's all. But that, I don't know how much time you will waste in terms of onboarding those people and how much time you will waste in terms of figuring out what the hell they are doing. So, yeah. so there is a there is a very uh, interesting paradox in this, which is which is something that I've observed. So, you know, before I got into Gojek, I've consulted across many different companies, uh, many different skills. And, and something that it took me a long time to grasp was that, you know, we talked about this at the start, that culture are the processes and policies that you do not define. Mm. It's everything else because your processes and policies are always a tiny subset of what you actually use for decision making. Mm -hmm. So when you start hiring very, very quickly, uh, and this is my engineering bias, right? Like I tend to look at this as a distributed computing problem. When, and I look at culture as the software that runs on your people, versus the software that runs on your hardware. Mm. And when you're running software on hardware, one of the problems you face in distributed computing is how do I synchronize and how do I build consensus? Because I have all of these different servers which are running software with different states. Mm. And if they're not in sync, the end result is different customers may see completely different experiences because the numbers are different. So in software, you have this, this problem in, 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 dist in distributed computing uh, around building consensus. Mm. Now, when you start bringing more and more people into the system, what ends up happening is people take time to absorb the software that's running on other people. Building consensus involves loading that software onto 
people. You call this onboarding, you can call this induction, call it what have you, right? You're making sound in Matrix, man. <laughs> the <laughs> movie. <laughs> you know, I'm, 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 I'm a dev or I like to think I am, right? And it's my bias. So, so what ends up happening is as you start hiring a lot of people in very quickly, there isn't time for that consensus to build. Mm. And so what happens is your organization starts devolving to depend entirely on your policies. Yeah. And the metrics, the performance metrics that you set in, say, your compensation policy is an example of that. And to Ajay's point, what ends up happening is people start optimizing for your formally defined processes and policies, which always, always, especially in, in fast growing companies, will skew the system in very, very nasty, unpredictable ways. Because the damping effect of culture, which is all of your undefined processes and policies, which is the vast majority of them, does not have time to synchronize across all these new people that have come in. Yep. And so the organization starts to skew in very strange, unpredictable ways because you have this small set of processes and policies now shaping everything. And I think one of the biggest downsides of, of companies that either don't have a strong or thick culture uh, or, or uh, actively foster it, which we'll get into in the second half of this discussion. But for those companies, I, I find that the, the natural instinct is just to motivate engagement and performance through financial incentives. Yep. And that leads to all kinds of problems. Soviet Union. All That's what happened to the Soviet Union. Centrally planned economies don't scale. I, it, it, I think that gunning for metrics is probably one of the, and, and linking compensation to metrics is, is one of the most dangerous things to do in management. I'm not saying it's not always a good idea, yeah. but I am saying that most of the time that I've seen, the bad outweighs. Yeah. You have unintended consequences. Good, a huge amount of unintended consequences. And I think that that is the compensating factor when you don't have strong cultural dynamics right. that foster engagement. And that's the point that I, I want to say right now, like strong cultures, I think personally, and please challenge me if you disagree, but I think that strong cultures build the most powerful sense of belonging in groups and teams. They do. They do. They when, do. when I can see my behavior reciprocated or mirrored in my day-to-day -day interactions with other people, yeah. I feel that we share something. Yes. When we share something, I feel intimacy. Yes. When I feel intimacy, I feel like I belong. Yes. And when I feel like I belong, that to me is one of the most powerful uh, characteristics of a high-performing culture. Because uh, like I read this recent book uh, by Daniel Coyle, I believe, called uh, uh, The Culture Code. A really great book, would recommend it to anyone. And, Basically, he, he, one of the concepts that came about there was how high-performing cultures stem from the sense of um, being versus connected. psychological safety. And being connected. Psychological safety. Uh, con uh, vulnerability is a big point. These are three sections. And then a sense of common purpose. Okay. Yeah. Common purpose. So it's kind of like this concept of belonging somewhere is one of the most powerful things to get individuals and teams to behave autonomously, yep. right? Yep. I feel safe making decisions in this yes. environment, even yes. though those decisions aren't codified and protected by policy. Yes. And like, I'll give you an example. Like last year, Nadeem was debating something, and Eng team actually went up to him saying, this is not right. Right. Edge team is engineering team. Sorry. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, the audience doesn't know what edge team is. Okay. okay. Product engineering team. Yes. Which includes, our, we at Gojek have product engineering team, which actually product management plus engineering plus design plus everything. We make them one. Right. Because we don't want silos. That's our part of our culture as well. Right. So engineering, product engineering team went to Nazim saying, this, this, this is not right. We're not going to do that. And they put very objectively things. And over the period of time, we discussed this like for like maybe one day. And then we agree, yes, you are, what you guys are saying is right. The only way it is possible, if they have all these three things which he said, psychological safety, being connected together, right. and we don't have like no sense of insecurity. That, those kind of things yes. actually define us that way, right? Yep. Yes. But when you think now, then you can, oh, this is what, this is what articulation is. 
but if you go overboard or you go a little bit further then you'll again figure out what the hell our culture is so you will always have these things you can think and codify but the time you start codifying you can codify like only 50% of it right. not rest of it do, do you remember when you know in the first year when when systems went awol all the time because we could not handle the load in our first year when the app was launched and i used to do these massive whatsapp rants yes <laughs> uh, where i was deeply punitive in both my language and in my you know what was that running joke N- nadim, N- is nadim is typing dot 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 <laughs> nadim yeah. is typing yeah so if, if if audience doesn't know if you're on whatsapp group yeah we are on whatsapp sorry uh, if you're on whatsapp group um when somebody is typing uh, it comes on the title saying this guy yeah. is typing yeah. and when we had downtime the only thing which come on top continuously is nadim is typing yeah. <laughs> you know like multi page <laughs> multi page rants typed out sorry guys full. i was a young founder okay that okay <laughs> i need an experience but basically i i was so verbally abusive whenever these things with the hope of creating the sense of gravity now you know how, how much indefinite patience i have right and and <laughs> and i noticed one of the things that by doing this by penalizing mistakes essentially what i was doing and creating huge amounts of of anxiety and frustration i began noticing that people were sharing less yep. of the mistakes on my group they were sharing it with other groups yep. but not on my whatsapp group right that was and i began noticing that people were not being upfront with me anymore uh in in many ways like they were kind of sugar coating some of the the situation and the gravity of of the problems and i began to notice that you know uh they were coming up to other people around me to get advice and help instead of going directly to me and so in that very early phase of our of my founding journey i i very quickly realized that creating a sense of psychological unsafety was detrimental actually not only did it make people burn out it also made people lose trust in being able to be open in a forum and because of that stress i caused other groups started popping up you, whereby there was psychological safety you, you in also, those groups you also created managing nadim experts yes <laughs> right like there were these people in the org whose expertise was managing nadim and so everyone would go through them there are a bunch of yeah. people who actually played that part in the last 3 and a half years yeah yeah. yeah yeah and and that's not good because that's extra friction yep. right that's extra friction you're not creating a culture whereby people are safe to make mistakes etc and you know i i i reluctantly changed my ways and it really i i saw firsthand the impact on on culture of sharing downtime sharing um root cause rcas and root cause analysis on on what happened there transparent and i did something very simple whereby every time you know a lot of times over email or everything when someone um said we had an outage or there was this bad deploy or we made a mistake on an assumption of something and we messed up you know just simply saying hey thank you for this thank you for fixing it thank yeah. you for telling me yeah. thank you for addressing it. it it had a massive i think i could feel and i couldn't describe how i feel i just felt this change in behavior that allowed okay I'm making a statement as a leader that it is okay and is appreciated because we get to learn all from your mistake. Yep. Thank you. Thank yep. you for sharing that with us. It's okay. Yep. Keep taking risks, guys. Yes. And and one of the challenges I faced as someone who's come from a tech dev eng background who spent most of his time doing non-eng stuff because I work on people, I work on that kind of stuff was uh, interestingly bringing the RCA culture there. you know it took i i literally had to become this caricature i had to become the rca guy and establish this precedent that i will demand an rca for every failure of employee experience mm. and there will be no negative consequence to that rca right there will only be a negative consequence to a trend of rcas where the same problem repeats itself over and over again without redressal right in 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 trying to move that migrate that culture from eng into non eng was a massive endeavor like i said i literally had to create this caricature personality whose response would always be this i need an rca so do's the rca guy can you imagine in like business 1.0 people would companies would actually 
incentivize that team for how many of those failures got reported and trying to bring it down. Yes. So what happened? They didn't get reported. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> if you if that's that's the dangerous part about doing. So what you're saying is that you did that and you made it explicit to your team yep. that n there will be no consequences yep. to the actual uh, issues that were faced. Yes. Only if it happened over a long period of time. Yeah. And, and, and recurring. And, and and my incentives were set on employee experience not on reducing the number of failures right because that just leads to things being hidden because a lower reported number means we're doing well whereas positively incentivizing and actually even repeating this idea that what we care about is how do our colleagues feel when they come into the office how do they feel when they fly into another office mm. and how do they feel when they have to go to this hotel in this city they've never been to mm. and how do they feel when they come into work led to a much more positive response. And that was purely cultural. There's no process or policy that talks about this. Right. What, what in your mind is the mechanism by which psychological safety creates higher performance? Why is that? I mean, a lot of people, you know, in traditional business, et cetera, there's always this sense of even a lot of founders, which I, and I was part of this group for a while, believe that a certain dose of fear of leadership, a certain dose of, uh, uh, I guess, bravado, right? Or like bravado, sorry, bravado, um, and, and um, explosiveness uh, should always, there should always be that slight fear to your sure. leadership. But the more I read books about this, the more I look at behavioral psychology, the more I learn about child psychology, and now that I'm a father, now I'm beginning to read a lot into that as well, is that actually the fundamental prerequisite of creativity and true state of flow is pure psychological safety. Absolutely. I, I mean, this, you know, this, this opinion of mine is somewhat controversial, uh, but I'll say it anyway, right? In systems and organizations, where you're dealing with a completely solved problem, where the system is clear, there is no evolution, and there is little or no need for creativity, mm. fear scales. And if you look at what you were calling business 1.0, most companies either already had a solved system, mm. or they thought they did. And that meant that fear actually scaled, or they believed it did. I have one more thing on that. So what happens is, if you look at the kind of companies we are, these kind of companies did not exist 20, 30 years back. Absolutely. Mm. They did not. What existed 20 years back for 300 years or 500 years was task-based labor force, right. where where the, the workers were optimized for the output, and the output, output did not have creativity. At it, all. In fact, the objective was to remove as much creativity for the s it, from the system as possible. It is. It is still in the manufacturing industry where you have this conveyor belt and people just do one task the whole day. They solder one bolt all the time. Right. right. Now, if you instill fear there, they'll work faster because there's no creativity. Right. Mm. Now you take that practice and bring it to practice of where you are, have to create something. Right. Mm. Now, when you want to create something. And you instill fear, what will happen? <coughs> creativity will have shortcuts. Right. And once your creativity will have shortcuts, you will make mistake. If you yep. make mistake, things will go haywire. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's not just the uh, create. I, mean, I think sometimes we 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 paint the picture of tech as in it's all about creativity, and everyone's in like creative rooms designing amazing things. It's it's when we talk about creativity to the audience, I just want to be clear that it's not just ideation. Mm -hmm. Creativity is actually figuring out how to flexibly solve problems that you did not expect. Yes. Multiple solutions for a strategic solve problem. Yes. And, and it's yes, worth exactly. calling out that... And in and tech, what we call the creative economy in tech, is actually because of the complexity, the lack of predictability about what problems we face every day yes. forces us to encourage creativity yeah. because otherwise we'll and end up having to solve yeah, and, problem. And, and, and in business 1.0 the stuff that you scaled by removing creativity and making it into a consistent repeated task and scale that by adding people to the system is now taken care of by hardware that's the point right those repeated tasks we run on computers yes yeah, also, uh, when Whereas I said the humans doing yeah, the value add, yeah, exactly complex yeah. thinking, and yes. I did not mean Eng when I said that because if you look at all departments of our company today, mm. 
So looking at Gojek as a hyper growth startup, all departments of company today have creativity. Mm. Whether it's eng, whether it's marketing, whether it's ops, yep. everyone. Yep. Like even if customer care, they have creativity there because they need to evolve and innovate on how do they serve customers better? How do they automate, automate regular tasks? How do they actually bring the strategic solution for long-term problems? And how do they reduce the issues, right? So in, in companies like us, which did not exist 20, 30 years back, the creativity is a core of the DNA. It is at the bottom of, at the core of like in center of the whole thing. And everybody actually has to percolate that culture, right? Mm -hmm. And when you look at creativity, there is no place for anger and ego. Because if you bring these two things in, it just dies. Yes. Yeah. So that's Be what happened. Because it is a very specific subset of creativity. Correct. Which is group-based creativity. Correct. Right? It is not, it is not an individual uh, you know, uh, it's creative creativity. right collaboration. Yes, that's what so, it is. So I, I like to say, uh, you know, and this is purely my this thing that, you know, there's this trifecta that allows you to drive things, which is love, respect, and fear. And when you're on the more creative side of things, you really need to dial down the fear and dial up the love and respect. Mm. Yes. And if you dial up the fear, you automatically dial the others down and the creativity dies. The creativity is fundamentally an iterative process of repeated failure until you hit success. Mm. And if you have fear, then you will not repeatedly fail until you succeed. Because you're afraid. There's a price to pay, emotional, financial, whatever. But there's a price to pay for failure. And that cost is real. And that cost is real. What about vulnerability? What about this theme? Also in the book, the, the Culture Code book that I read, uh, there was this whole point, and it kind of codified a lot of the things we knew intuitively, right? Uh, why we instinctively say publicly that, uh, as leaders, that, me, hey guys, I don't really know about this, yep. but, right? Yep. Or when we go and we say, you know, uh, guy, my bad, that was a total mistake. I assumed that wrong. Uh, I thought that was going to work, and it didn't. Right. And seeing that behavior displayed of saying, you know, I messed up, yep. uh, and and that being completely okay. Wh where does that fit in? Uh, where does vulnerability actually fit in into into? Where how does that translate into so, high performing? So for me, vulnerability is 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 a way of saying. I iterate too. Hmm. If I'm. I'm literally telling you that I fail also. You know, it's very dangerous. And that's it. fine. And it's fine because in this kind of an environment, there are two extremely bad outcomes to not exposing that through vulnerability, right? One is you risk setting yourself up as this distant, unreachable figure who never screws up. Mm. And somebody who never screws up will harshly judge someone who does. That's the perception. Yes. Right? So if you hide your failures from your colleagues, your peers, your seniors, your juniors, it means that the perception builds that you don't fail, which is obviously false because in, in our kind of environment where we just do not know the real solutions to a problem at any level in the org, you become someone who's unapproachable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have... I don't so feel like I belong yeah. Yeah. in so your perfect no perfect mistake Perfect little world, world. right? Yeah, I, I have another way to say this. I always say, and I, we discussed this with as well, I said like, expression of vulnerability is manifestation of collaboration. Yeah. I mm. always say that. Like, as Say that again. Expression right. of vulnerability is manifestation of collaboration. I like that. Yeah, because every time you express that you are vulnerable to something, you will have your peers collaborate with you to get you out of that situation. If they know that Ajay is weak at this area, I have people who will actually look out for me. Yep. Mm. And if people don't express their vulnerabilities, then they will fail so badly. Because no is, one's covering you there, yeah, right? Because no one covering you. Mm. And we have we have had few leaders who actually did not express that vulnerability. They actually try to overcome that vulnerability by painting a false facade. Yeah. Mm. And once the facade goes down, they're exposed so badly that nobody respects so you, that. So you literally yeah. took the second second big risk out of my mouth, right? which is a leader or a decision maker, leader is actually a, a bad, bad phrase here, any decision maker who hides their failures will eventually, no matter what they try to do, end up exposing those failures and then be painted a hypocrite. Hmm. I'll give one more And example. then they will just 
fail. Like then nobody respects them to Ajay's point, and then you're you're done. There's nothing you can do beyond that point. You you you've got a tactical trajectory of success, but a strategic tra- trajectory of failure. It, does it have something to do with this kind of sense of camaraderie as well? That if your leader does not share their failures, that means they're not in the trenches with you in the beginning. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. That means you're. So By there's no stakes. You, you're no. not taking any yeah. any. Uh, I mean, someone who you cannot possibly be in the real world trenches without right. failing. You're not in the ring with me. Yeah, you're right in an now. imaginary insulated world where you don't fail, and, and that, that prevents collaboration. And people feel f- when they look at a uh, someone, a decision maker who never fails, after a while, especially people who worked and been around for a bit, start to suspect this person. This person has fall guys mm. because if they've never failed, fall guys, yeah, because guys they, that they blame, yeah, goods. because if they've never failed, that's impossible. That means every time they failed, someone else has taken the blame. Someone's taken. So I probably you. shouldn't be around this person because the question is when do I become the fall guy? And that links to the psychological safety. I'll give you an example. I'll give you our early days example. How many times we had down times, and how many times after those down times we had long chat. On phone for hours, mm. and what did we do over there? We collaborated to figure out how do I come out of that, right? Mm. Or you had this calls with Sidhu or Niranjan or anybody, or we had group calls saying, "Hey guys, let's problem solve this." Yeah. If I would have told you, no, 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 it's a hardware fault. Network went down, not my fault. After a few times, what would have happened? I lose trust. Correct. Not only that, you would have never ever to bring your perspective as a business person. Because when you look at a problem, so what happens, and when we look at problems at Eng, uh, we kind of have this uh, empathy bias, like we know that oh, this developer did not do this thing right, and I know the problem. Once I know the problem, I can't problem solve it. Like if I am, so suppose you give me a deadline, I know that this guy can't do it, so I will actually not be able to do it. But once you bring it outside perspective to me. When this downtime happened, what did you do? You actually asked me so many questions. You can't call those stupid questions, but you asked me very basic questions mm. every time. We collaborated on those basic questions, and what came out was a solution, yeah. which was a very valid solution. So it was a shortcut. Remember this Gopi out of going sync was yeah. just a shortcut, yeah. and it came out despite because despite me knowing nothing, nothing about engineering. Correct. Right. If I would have not expressed my vulnerability to you, we would have never collaborated. So. Th- It is, it and is. that and that makes me feel respected because even as a non-engineer, you had enough respect to ask me or to to follow through my train of thought, and yes. we came up with a solution together, yeah. which increases my level of confidence and increases my sense of belonging in Gojek Engineering. Yes, it's, it's, that I'm not just an alien outsider trying to tell you guys what to do. I belong because yeah. I helped solve that problem and this together is with of, engineering. One of my failures consistently, and it took me a long time to recognize that, was. Without intending to, I f- I realized after the fact that I was being condescending to non-technical people that I was discussing issues with, mm. and what I was doing in the process by being condescending was without exposing my world. I was literally taking a position of superiority, however unintentionally, mm. which meant that they don't feel respected, mm. and then the collaboration dies. Mm. Yeah, that's the the appreciation point. Is so interlinked with vulnerability. I feel like they're kind of flip sides of the same coin in many ways, right? To, to appreciating people has to do with the authenticity and the intimacy brought by the sense of shared kind of pain yep. <laughs> together that yeah. you cannot replace in any other way. Then there's the kind of this final component, which is the purpose or the mission, mm-hmm. right? Then there's that. As well, yep. that is as important as these these other elements as well. Yep. What is it about culture that that resonates so strongly with having a strong purpose or mission together? How does mission affect culture in a, in a team? Does it even affect? I mean, I uh, I was skeptical of this, but you know, mutual friends of ours who are founders, uh, you know. Who've seen this before many years ago? Once told me this. I was like, "Hey, dude, uh, there's this dev I know who's just moved. This was in the Bay Area. I was visiting. Who's just moved to the Bay Area. He's really good. You should hire him." And he was like, "He knows me. He knows what we're doing. If he believes in our product, he will call me. Mm. But if he doesn't believe in our product, I'm not going to hire him because then there is no point." Mm. 
And over time, I came to realize that if culture is your uncodified decision-making process, your mission is what provides this unwavering backbone to those uncodified decision-making uh, processes. The why. It's the why. The why. And I guess, you know, for all the times that we stumbled through the initial phases of create, trying to create a shared culture, what really pulled us all together, despite the fact that we didn't focus on it in the beginning, was that mission yep. and purpose. People stayed for that. Yep. People bled for that. Last week, somebody, I was interviewing with somebody and they, no, they were, I was not interviewing with somebody. I was interviewing with somebody, not with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awkward. <laughs> so, so one of the things they said is like very nice thing they said is like, okay, Ajay, I heard all this stuff about your mission and all the stuff. Tell me, what are you doing for environment and people? And mm. that actually got me started. And we spoke about like 45 minutes, mm. like what, what our mission is, what we are doing for people, what we are doing for environment, how are we thinking about you know, like impacting Indonesians or impacting other countries where we are going, and how positively we change the life of people. And I showed him everything whatever we could do. I could have not done that if I did not know the mission. And they could have not got, got uh, influenced by us if they did not know that we, are, we really truly believe in what we are doing. Mm. One thing is that. And second, we are acting on it. Mm. So, and that kind of, once you have that thing, mission, our mission, what our mission is, our mission is to go and do right thing for drivers, mm. impact their lives. Mm. That means we will never do something wrong for drivers. Mm. That becomes our culture. I mean, we actually have this as a tagline on our empl employer branding in some of our campaigns. Mm. Nice people, hard problems. <laughs> nice people, hard problems. Hard problems. <laughs> like for example, we are talking about Go Food, right? And we are talking about, like looking at Go Food and how can we be more environment friendly f within the Go Food. Like Go Cafe is our good example. Go Food Cafe is very good cafe we have, by the way. You should come and see it. Uh, so Go Cafe, uh, we transformed Go Cafe from being not very environment friendly to very environment friendly now. Mm. We have every biodegradable product over there. We don't use plastic. If you go to our offices, we don't use plastic. Right, and that actually has a very big mission and, change. And we never said this as an instruction. I, I remember in, in in India office, at no point have I ever mandated this. Yeah. But one fine day, all the disposable cups went away, and there were these reusable steel mugs that showed up, beautifully designed, and I had nothing to do with it. Yeah, it wasn't a command. It wasn't was, a policy. No. It it becomes emergent behavior. Yep. And I think that's the most salient point about culture. Yep. Yep. It is the most scalable and viral way of generating either positive or negative, negative. Yep. behaviors. And it creates that powerful sense of shared identity, which is just another word of saying, I belong here. Yep. And that's why I said culture is the expression of a group. Yep. It's why I always uh, anchor on, on, on things where I say, I'm most proud of stuff that I had nothing to do with. Yeah. That's that's the stuff I'm most proud of. That's when you know culture is kicking in. Exactly. And alive and well. Guys, we're running out we're we've run out of time, but we could go on hours on this subject. Thank you so much for the insights. Please come again on the Go Figure podcast when Thank you can. Thank you for having us. Thank All you right. for having us. And we'll Thank have you. more fights on this. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thanks guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you liked it, please hit like, subscribe, and follow us on social media. Thanks so much for tuning in.